After a couple of days off, the Memphis Grizzlies are back in action tonight. It is game two at FedEx Forum. DeMichael Cole will be there covering for the commercial appeal as well as Locked On Grizzlies. I will not be there, but I will be watching. And I know you'll be watching as well to see how Memphis responds to the adversity that they face once again at the hands, this time of the Los Angeles Lakers. Plus, we're going to lead off with a John Morant injury update. This is Locked On Grizzlies Game 2 Preview. Let's lock in. You are Locked On Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's your boys, the White T boys. It is DeMichael Cole and Joe Mullinax here with you for another installment of Locked on Grizzlies. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also, of course, check us out on YouTube. Like, comment, rate, review, subscribe, all those fun things. We appreciate it. We are also here at Locked on Grizzlies. This episode sponsored by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. To Michael, we have finally gotten finally. back to basketball. It feels yes. like it's been forever since that Sunday matinee contest in which Memphis fell to the Los Angeles Lakers in a larger score than the actual outcome was of the game. It was a closer game than it actually looked like in terms of the box score. Memphis has had a chance to practice, and I know you're about to talk to us a little bit about that. They have had a chance to kind of lick their wounds a little bit, to celebrate Jaron Jackson Jr. a little bit, the defensive player of the year. You were at practice on Tuesday. What was the general vibe around the team? You know, we'll get to John Morant here in a moment. Yeah. What was the general vibe around the team in terms of moving forward from game one into game two? Pretty loose, I would say. I mean, it, it, the guys are loose. You got to think about it. This is a team that's lost game one, you know, last season two times. So it's like, hey, it's not somewhere we haven't been before. And it's more of uh, Taylor Jenkins has kind of really drilled this one game into these guys. You know, Xavier Tillman said he doesn't like to think of it as pressure. Like he doesn't want to think of it as a must win game. Like, of course, in the general sense, you, you want to win you know, one of your two home games at least. But he's not thinking of it like it's a must-win game. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're taking it one game at a time. They seem pretty loose, and uh, I think there is some benefit to that. They are a team that is not – and we talked a little bit about it yesterday in the Jaron Jackson Jr. Defensive Player of the Year uh, Mm -hmm. award episode. They are not a team that, again, the Kobe Mamba mentality, the stare down, the LeBron James sitting there like this for five minutes getting hyped. (laughs) You know, they yeah. dance to get hype. You know what I'm saying? Like, not to say LeBron's not dancing, but you, everybody prepares for games differently. Everybody views the game differently. And I think the Grizzlies view it in a different way than most NBA teams. The Athletic put out their uh, their player survey. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed, maybe we can talk about this on a future episode. Uh, one of the things I noticed is the trash talking and talking about the Memphis kids and how they, they talk a lot and – you know, they, they just have a different aura and vibe around them, and they're unapologetically themselves, right? Like, what I don't did the survey say? What did, I, it, I didn't see that. Said part of something it. along the lines of they they talk when they're up and they don't talk when they're losing, oh, uh, which I, you know, yeah, I think that's probably a fair thing. Yeah. Um, what did, again, Lu- Luca said everyone's tough when they're up, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. So maybe that's maybe that's an off season episode of Lockdown mm-hmm. Grizzlies. Whenever that comes, uh, that we can discuss that. But, you know, the, what I took away from it was people, you know, there was no the Lakers kids. There's no the Bucks kids. You know what I mean? Like there is a Memphis kids aura. Maybe aura is not the best word, but there's a vibe around the team that if they're uptight, I don't see them as being prepared. Right. Like I would be worried about them if it was really quiet. I would be worried about them if they weren't loose. So that's actually a good thing to hear. Another good thing to hear from Taylor Jenkins, and I know you talked with him. You got to see John Morant. His hand was padded up at practice. Uh, But uh, John Morant for tonight is officially questionable with that injured hand. Uh, Questionable by NBA injury markings is usually 50-50. 
but I know you'll talk a little bit more about this to Michael. With the Grizzlies, questionable usually means he's going to try to play. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of what's happening here. But I'll start with the good. Let's get the good out the way first. Please, we'll back, good we'll is back good. With the bad. But uh, the good here is, you know, John Morant, Tuesday morning, was able to dribble with his right hand, was able to shoot with his right hand. I asked Taylor Jenkins how it looked, and he basically told me, yeah, there's some stiffness there. You know, it doesn't look exactly like John Morant yet, but there was some progress made from Monday to Tuesday, and they're expecting similar progress uh, from Tuesday to Wednesday. And if that's the case, uh, they feel like it's going to be, you know, worth giving a shot uh, to play in game two. Now to the bad. Uh, I don't think he's going to play. Just just a, just a general hunch uh, from what I've gathered. For one, I think the questionable – remember, there's some gamesman, you know, uh, strategy here in the playoffs as yeah. well. You, you, you don't want to give, you know, uh, the opponent the upper hand. And remember, uh, talking to Darvin Ham on yesterday as well, he said that the Lakers are going to prepare as if John Morant is playing. So with that being the case, if Ja doesn't play because you have him questionable and you're kind of leaving, you know, that open endedness on the Lakers side, Tyus Jones could potentially. Now, we know they have guys like LeBron who prepare for anything, but Mm -hmm. there's the potential to kind of catch them off guard a little bit uh, in that way there. But overall, uh, Ja hasn't done much with his right hand. When we were at practice, the media viewing portion of practice, he did not use his right hand at all. Uh, He just casually shot some hook shots, floaters with his left hand. His right hand pretty much was just dangling off to the side, and he wasn't doing much. And then eventually they came, uh, as you mentioned earlier, they they, uh, taped it up, patted his hand up, and that was it. So he didn't do anything uh, with his right hand during the media uh, portion of practice. Again, uh, Taylor Jenkins did say uh, that Tuesday morning that Job was doing some dribbling and some shooting, but he said there was some stiffness, stiffness there. So in my opinion, Joe, knowing that he had some stiffness on Tuesday morning uh, when he was shooting, it's, it's going to be hard flesh for me to see him playing because if he plays, he won't be as impactful as John Morant. And John Morant, out of his own words, he told us on Sunday, he said, look, if if I don't feel like I can be John Morant, then I'm not going to get in the way. He's not going to, uh, you know, he's shown, I mean, from making a decision to come off the bench, he's shown he can be a team first guy. And he said, if he's not, if he feels like he's not going to be able to be impactful in helping the team, uh, He's not going to get in the way of that. So I'm leaning more towards thinking that uh, this is this will be a game that he potentially misses. But uh, the good news is I think we both said this before. We still think this is a winnable game with or without Ja, and that will kind of put you in position to rest him a couple more days going into that Saturday game. But that's just my hunch. Uh, at the end of the day, he's listed as questionable. If he does play, I'm pretty sure there will be some limitations there. But uh, – there's no doubt about it. John Moran is super effective with his left hand, as we've all seen. So he still can be a super dynamic player while doing most of his work with his left hand. That's an interesting point about the the two extra days, right? Because they play game yeah. two Wednesday night tonight, and then they don't play again until Saturday. So if Ja was to sit out, it would put him in a position to have those extra days of care. I'm guessing Memphis will travel to L.A., you know, uh, you would know this better than me, Thursday or Friday. Yeah, Thursday. Um, mm-hmm. Thursday is when they're heading out. So, you know, that gives them an extra day to kind of get used to the time change and get mm-hmm. their feet under them, that sort of stuff. So I I would imagine that the treatment and all those sorts of things that would help him be better for game three, which Memphis has to get one of those two on the road just to get home court back, right? Like they have to win one of the two in Los Angeles at some point. In theory, it doesn't have to be game three or game four but they have to do it eventually. Um, I, I'm curious as to what Morant, you know, you said if he's not John Morant, but as we've talked about on recent episodes of Locked on Grizzlies, what yeah, does that even mean like anymore? Yeah. Right? Like, what does that even mean anymore? So how much of all of this, you know, he was like, uh, he, he was, he looked very broken on Sunday and the conversation. In the interviews, yeah. In the interviews, he looked very downtrodden. And I'm not, I'm, it's not being judgmental. I, if I had endured what he had endured, I would probably look and feel the it's same the way. Truth. People, yeah. yeah, and he's being honest, right? Like you can appreciate he that. He says about this him. himself, right? Yeah. Right. So I think that, you know, there's a mental aspect to this. He's still trying to figure out who John Morant, after all of these things happened, is. 
and we haven't seen that guy from before the drama and the the various issues uh, and the suspension. You know, we haven't seen that same jaw. So I, I'm curious to see how it plays out. It's really going to be fascinating to watch. And obviously it's going to impact rotations, going to impact scheme, X's and O's. And the fun thing about this matchup, to Michael, I know you wrote about this for the commercial appeal. People should go check it out. We're going to talk about it next. Darvin Ham and Taylor Jenkins have some history. They have some backstory to their coaching matchup. Darvin Ham won round one. How can Taylor Jenkins bounce back in round two tonight against the Lakers? We're going to talk about that next here on Lockdown Grizzlies. But first, this episode of Lockdown Grizzlies is brought to you by Ultimate Basketball Pro Basketball GM. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is an addictive basketball game. It's the coolest game I've played in a long time. I thought I could be a great NBA GM, and it turns out that it's not all that easy. If you've had the same thought, you fantasize about managing your own basketball team, go and download Ultimate Pro Basketball GM right now. This game lets you manage every strategic aspect of a franchise, dealing with personalities from players and coaches, hiring the right people to train and support your players, trading players, making draft picks, and navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft and all the ups and downs of multiple seasons. This is in a, all happening in a realistic and challenging game world. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free and playable offline. You can play on the go as you want and when you want to. Locked on Grizzlies listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code Locked On in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up on the app stores. That's probasketballgm.com, Ultimate Basketball GM. Start your dynasty today. We're talking Ham, Jenkins, and the X's and O's counterpunch next here on Lockdown Grizzlies. Welcome back to Lockdown Grizzlies. I am your co-host, Joe Molinax of Bluff City Media. I also write over at SB Nation from time to time. Joined by my co-host, Michael Cole, Commercial Appeal, Memphis Grizzlies beat writer. He will be there front and center covering, not just for co the Commercial Appeal, of course, but also a little bit of Locked On Grizzlies love. And, DeMichael, you have a tremendous piece for the Commercial Appeal that I recommend everybody go check out. Subscribe to the Commercial Appeal. It's well worth the money just for DeMichael himself. I mean, look at that guy if you're watching on YouTube. <laughs> just look at him. And if you're listening – you know how smart he is. It's even better with writing. Just trust me. Go subscribe to Commercial Appeal if you haven't already done it. Just do it. Do it now. I'll wait a couple of seconds for you to do it. Okay, so you're subscribed to Commercial Appeal. You should have the article in front of you. Darvin Ham, Taylor Jenkins, they have a pretty close relationship to Michael, and obviously that ties back to their previous stops on their way to becoming head coaches. And, of course, that uh, coaching tree that they're a part of is a pretty unique and growing one in the NBA. Yeah, I, uh, just writing that story, I learned so much about these two guys and and how close they are. But this Darvin Ham, Taylor Jenkins thing, not only just in their personal relationship, but how it'll play into this series, which I'm sure you'll talk a little bit more about as well, uh, Joe, here. But these are two guys that have been connected since 2013, 2014, that Atlanta Hawks coaching staff. By the mm -hmm. way, that Atlanta Hawks coaching staff in 2013 loaded under Mike Budenholzer might be one of the most loaded coaching staffs we have ever seen in the NBA. Uh, four assistant coaches have gone on to become uh, NBA coaches. Kenny Atkinson went to the, to the Nets, and now he's an assistant with the, mm -hmm. with the Warriors. But Kenny Atkinson, Quinn Snyder, who did a terrific job with Utah Jazz and is now with the Hawks. And then there's these two guys, Darvin Ham, Taylor Jenkins, four guys under Mike Budenholzer, who isn't too shabby himself, by the no, way. No, so good. Uh, I mean, loaded. And just just listening to you know, I talked to some former players that played on the teams. You know, Dennis Schroeder, Kyle Korver, and and listen to Kyle Korver say, man, at, back then you kind of had a feeling. You know, when all the coaches would come in and talk about how they were arguing in the coaches meetings and things like that. And that's kind of what Darvin Ham alluded to when we asked him about him and Taylor Jenkins the, the other day. He, he had a kind of little funny joke. He said, well, I guess we're going to see who was right in all those coaches meetings when we would argue. So <laughs> you got you got to got that part of it. And then, you know, Taylor Jenkins, most of you have heard, you know, you listen to it on YouTube when he talks in press conferences. You know, Taylor Jenkins doesn't uh, reveal his cards too much. 
But this is one of the rare times, Joe, and Joe, you, you've heard him talk a lot as well. Mm-hmm. It's one of the rare times where I've heard him say, I want to beat this guy. He said, I, I'm trying to beat him. And, and that's not something you usually hear from Taylor Gene. He's very much the, the isms, right? The mm-hmm. one game at a time or and, and you know, respecting mm-hmm. each opponent and all those things. But he wants to beat Darvin Ham. Darvin Ham wants to beat him. But the thing is, that relationship overall, that six years they spent together, there's some identity similarities in these teams. The Grizzlies and Lakers, both top five in the NBA and rebounded both top five in the NBA in transition scoring. What were the two main emphasis that we talked about, you know, after the game when we said uh, the Grizzlies want to clean up two things. It was on the glass going against this team because the Lakers dominated second chance points. And it was also the fast break points where the Lakers dominated two things that the Grizzlies are usually really good at as well. So they, mm-hmm. the identities kind of are similar because they come from those same coaching backgrounds. And now Joe, as you just mentioned, here comes the fun part, right? Uh, Darvin Ham threw the first punch, but the thing about it is you got to punch four times and you got to connect four times. Now Taylor Jenkins has the chance to adjust, and we'll see how Darvin Ham continues to make adjustments because you can't be stagnant. And these two guys know each other really well, so uh, it's really going to show kind of who uh, has the coaching chops after this series. We talked on yesterday's show a little bit about the side pick and roll action that yeah. Austin Reeves and Anthony Davis were running, putting Xavier Tillman in a bit of a bind led to LeBron James being open for some threes, led to Austin Reeves having some pull-up jumpers because there had to be drop coverage off of that pick and roll. All sorts of different troubles that Memphis was not able to adjust to. And I think Mm -hmm. that stands out in my mind's eye as the main thing, X's and O's wise, that needs to be addressed. Because Austin Reeves, for all our talk about Rui Achimura not getting that hot again, and sorry, Lakers fans, that are he's not going to get that hot again. You can yell at me all you want. It's not going to happen. Um, Austin Reeves absolutely can do that again. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I'm, I'm not going to say the same thing about oh, yeah. Austin Reeves. I never have and I never will. I was very impressed with how he played, and I think that is replicate. he can replicate that. They have to find ways to put their team, the Grizzlies team, in a better situation, whether it's blitzing that a little bit more, forcing a double team off of that, whether it's not double teaming LeBron James as much when he gets the ball, obviously that's a different action, but just, you know, I think that there was too much attention paid to LeBron offensively. That would be my biggest schematic adjustment going into game two. Dylan Brooks is going to probably be named second team, all NBA defense, probably maybe he gets knocked off a little bit, but he's worthy of that recognition of being one of the best defensive players in the league perimeter in particular lebron james is 38 years old and has a foot that is not 100 percent does it mean that lebron's not capable of doing amazing things he obviously did in game one and he'll continue to but if dylan brooks is as good as we say he is and if dylan brooks as a impending unrestricted free agent is trying to show how good he is he should be saying let me have lebron solo I think that frees up some of the issues that we're seeing in terms of the pick and roll issues. People are helping off too much with LeBron when, or when they are helping on LeBron, Mm -hmm. LeBron is very capable of finding that passer. He is one of the best passers in the history of the NBA. Mm -hmm. Anthony Davis double team him. If he, if Anthony Davis has seven or eight assists, you live with that. That's just kind of reality, right? Anthony Davis is somebody that is not as prolific as a creator of offense for others as LeBron James. So I think that you have to trust Dylan Brooks, as scary as that is to say out loud. I think that's the main schematic adjustment. I would stop having guys over help on LeBron. I would have Dylan Brooks take on the brunt of that assignment. What about you? You know what, Joe? I'd be willing to try that, but on a very short lease. I say, hey, sure. let's 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 go out here for the first quarter. Uh, Dylan, you're on an island. Let, let's see. Now, of course, at the end of the day, uh, the island that we're talking about is 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 limited in a way because if he goes to the rim, Jaron Jackson Jr. is going to come. And sure. that's a product to how the Lakers have kind of used their starting lineup. They're starting Jared Vanderbilt, which allows, as we said, uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. to kind of roam in a way. But what mm-hmm. we saw was those double teams on LeBron and AD, they were on the, on the touch. So LeBron's getting the ball, you know, in the mid post. 
they're coming all the way up there uh 20 feet away from the basket right. to, to double team him but i think what we're kind of on the same page about is let dylan have him in that area but when he gets downhill and he gets sure. going to the basket that's when jaron comes over from the weak side and you know knocks it off the glass and i like that idea now because you're onto something here you people are probably saying no you double LeBron. No, you double AD. Well, guess what? You got Rui Hachimura, who is a very talented offensive player. Austin Reeves, as you said, can replicate his performance. And guess what? D'Angelo Russell can not only replicate his performance in that last game, but he could do even better than that. Mm-hmm. So uh, you got to be conscious of all of that and what those guys bring to the table. But I'm with you, Joe. I think you tried it out, but on a very short leash. If LeBron gets going, then guess what? Hey, role players, beat me again. Sure. I think that, you know, we talked yesterday about making AD beat you with fadeaways in the mid-range. Similar concept with LeBron, right? Like yeah. make him – if LeBron James and Anthony Davis score 50 or 60-plus points combined and most of those points are coming from mid-range jumpers, they're a hell of a basketball team and you tip your cap, Yeah, right? Like it's, some, it's called defense for a reason. You're going to give up something. And I think that is kind of the gist and the genesis of Taylor Jenkins' defensive philosophy. He wants to give up threes to the right people the right people on uh, on sunday the right person was rui achimura and he got hot how they tweak that scheme again i I think if they don't help as much as lebron that'll put them in a spot to better defend these open threes that is something to keep an eye on heading into game two tonight tonight is game two to michael and we will continue our preview of grizzlies lakers game two next here on lockdown grizzlies but first this episode of Lockdown Grizzlies is brought to you by Game Time. I got to tell you, Michael, when I was in Memphis and I didn't have season tickets, there was one glorious season where I did have season tickets. <laughs> but when I didn't have season tickets and when I wasn't covering as a member of the media, it would be a struggle sometimes, whether it's the Lakers, the Warriors, whatever the game might be, trying to get tickets late notice. You sometimes feel a little stressed out with that. It shouldn't be that stressful, and game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets to all the sporting, music, comedy, and theater events near you. Flash deals, easy to find tickets, images of the seat view so you know exactly what perspective you'll be getting when you get to your seat, and the lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, all sorts of job loss protections included via game time. Game time is the app for you. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We will be discussing and previewing more of Game Two Grizzlies Lakers next here on Locked On Grizzlies. Welcome back to Locked On Grizzlies. We're finishing up our Wednesday Game 2 preview episode of Locked On Grizzlies. I'm joined by the the wonderful DeMichael Cole of the Commercial Appeal there in Memphis, Tennessee, Grizzlies beat writer for that publication and website. I am Joe Mullinax. I am the former head of Grizzly Bear Blues for SB Nation. Now GBB is part of Bluff City Media. Make sure you're checking out Bluff City Media as well as the Commercial Appeal for all of your Grizzlies content heading in to Game to tonight to michael <laughs> mm-hmm. it's a big one right oh it's oh, a big yeah. one in memphis tennessee tonight it's not a must win like we alluded to earlier in the show technically they can still fight back but it just becomes much less likely if they lose this game so let's do it this way because again yeah. john moran is questionable as of this morning as of this recording obviously yeah. more information will come out on that throughout the day And, of course, before the game, Uh, let's do a key to the game if Ja plays and a key to the game if Ja does not play. Uh, And I'll go first with my key to the game if he plays. You need to find a way to get him off the ball, get him cutting to the basket. Mm -hmm. You have Desmond Bain. You have Luke Kennard. They tried some two-point guard lineups because of Jared Vanderbilt. There's opportunity there that I think that they have to find different entry points to the action of Morant having the ball in his hands. I would like to see more baseline cuts, more alley-oop kind of things, maybe some high-low if they're going to pay more attention to Jaron Jackson Jr., have him get the ball in the high post, hit hit jaw 
on a cut on the baseline for an alley oop. Mm-hmm. You know, Jaron has shown the ability to pass a little bit lately. Yeah. I think that you have to make Jaw almost like Allen Iverson as a scoring guard. Obviously, Iverson was not the high flying athlete necessarily that Morant is, but letting him be off the ball and giving him that priority to slash. That would be my jaw specific key to the game. Key to the game. And do you want me to do both? Sure. Uh, that'd be sure. fine. Okay. okay I'll, I'll do both because quite frankly, they're the same thing. And there you I'll go. Explain. The key to the game, Desmond Bain. If Ooh, Jaw plays. That's a big the one. Key, the key to the game, if Jaw doesn't play, Desmond Bain. I think game two, there's no more important player on the floor. Uh, than Desmond Bank for what the Grizzlies need to happen. Now, mm-hmm. uh, Jaron Jackson Jr., I feel like, is going to give you you know, uh, his portion. But if you want to win, Desmond Bain has to do a lot. And when I say a lot, we're not talking about just shoot and make six, seven, three-pointers. No, he has to do more than that. Desmond Bain has to help on the glass and rebound uh, because we've talked about how the big men, uh, quite frankly, it's, it's not just them that's going to be able to keep Jared Vanderbilt and Anthony Davis off the glass. The guards have to help. It's a five-man job. So Desmond Bain's going to have to rebound the ball, and he's going to have to be a playmaker, whether Ja mm-hmm. plays or not. You touched on it a little bit there. If Ja Morant plays, what the Grizzlies will need to do more in those starting lineups is, you know, getting Des more on the ball uh, to, to create some of those situations you just mentioned where you get Ja uh, cut into the basket. Because at the end of the day, uh, Jared Vanderbilt was hounding John Morant in that Absolutely. first game. And, and even Dennis Schroeder, when he comes in the game, he's going to do the same thing. Uh, if John Morant can't dribble to the same level, it's going to be a struggle. So that's why you want Desmond Bain to kind of take some of that pressure off. Of course, Tyus will do the same. But if Ja doesn't play, then Desmond Bain becomes your backup point guard. And then you really need him to kind of step up to that playmaking role. Desmond Bain's assist went up from 2.7, 2.7 as his second year to 4.4 in his third years. I think he also averaged around five rebounds a game, too. Uh, In this game, I think you need no less than six boards. And I'm going to say six assists, but you really need seven or eight uh, from Desmond Bain uh, to win this game, I think. Desmond Bain has to be a big part of it. Yes, the shooting and all that, of course. We talk about that all the time. But it's more the playmaking load has to be taken off of Ja. Des is the best equipped to do that. Uh, If you go back to March 7th when the Grizzlies lost against the Lakers, I think this is a game Desmond Bain and the Grizzlies should watch. I went back and looked at it a little bit. There was no jaw in that game. Tyus Jones Mm -hmm. and Desmond Bain were the backcourt. Desmond Bain scored seven points on three of 14 shooting, Joe, his lowest scoring game of the season. The Grizzlies only lost that game by nine points. On the road, 112-103, and Desmond Bain only scored seven points. Desmond Bain – scored double figures in every other game in 2023. So, quite frankly, I don't suspect that to happen again. It happened because, you know, he started getting primary defensive assignments. You started to see the big-time defenders switch over to Desmond Bain. It'll be interesting to see how he adjusts to that. But Desmond Bain, uh, I can't say it enough. I think he's just as important as anyone uh, if the Grizzlies want to win this game. I would agree. You'll never hear me argue against Desmond Bain. I love Desmond Bain so much. Um I agree uh, with Desmond Bain needing to have a greater game. And obviously, if Ja is out, you talk about the primary defender. You know, somebody like Jared Vanderbilt might be on Bain. And if if that happens, you know, now you're looking at trying to find ways to get Bain open in a similar energy to Ja. I think you got to make these dudes run through screens, man. I think you got to set screen after screen, tire these guys out. They don't. The Grizzlies do that some. They've especially done it more since the arrival of Luke Kennard. Uh, but they just need to set pick after pick, screen after screen. Jared Vanderbilt has very good cardio, elite cardio, similar to Dylan <laughs> Brooks. Wear these dudes out and get them to try to sag off a little bit. You know, it's going to be a challenge. The Lakers have improved defensively uh, since their trade deadline deals. You have to try to make them work a little bit. My key without job would be Luke Kennard and Luke Kennard. You can make an argument as a key with jaw, but especially if jaw is not there, Kennard's going to have to take on some of that facilitating. Kennard has to be more aggressive shooting the three as we've talked about before. And Kennard needs to understand that the offense at times, the best look for this Grizzlies unit as they are currently constructed is him. 
So he might think that an extra pass is needed, but if that extra pass is Dylan Brooks, no offense to it. Dylan Brooks, yeah. don't make that pass. Your good shot, Luke Kennard, is better than Dylan Brooks's great shot at this stage of the season. I would like to see those three-point shot attempts double at least. I think he only took four in game one. He needs to take at least eight in game two, at least. And again, if that means that you have to work on getting him open more, double screen. Make sure that you're having lots of different sets where he's running and coming across, pin downs, all sorts of different ways, flare screens. There's all sorts of X's and O's stuff we can discuss Mm -hmm. to get him different looks. Variety is the spice of life. Don't let the Lakers be able to predict you. You know that they know that Luke Kennard wants to shoot the three, but you want to be able to, in the half court, get him open looks. In transition, he's going to be open. We saw that multiple times in game one. It's the half court sets, getting him those shots, forcing the Lakers to play sound defense before they can fully get their defense set. That is going to be a major key to this game. So I, I think that yeah. we're in agreement That's that the, back, the, the backcourt is probably the most important piece. Because, again, Anthony Davis is going to get his. He's right? a monster. <laughs> LeBron James is going to, to a lesser extent, get his. Again, they're two of the top 12 or so players in the NBA. It's the other guys that Memphis has to continue to find ways to work around and get around and beat. If they're not able to, it's going to be a short series for the home team, and that's not something that any of us want to see. So a big game here for the Grizzlies against the Lakers. Make sure that you are checking in with us tomorrow here at Lockdown Grizzlies as we talk about Game 2 and all those fun things. Big, big, big contest there in Memphis, and we're excited to watch it unfold uh, just like you are here at Lockdown Grizzlies. Thank you for making Lockdown Grizzlies your first listen each and every day. Shout out to our everydayers, the people that are here with us Monday through Friday. It is appreciated. Tomorrow on the show, I'm going to be flying solo. DeMichael has a late night covering the team down at FedEx Forum for the commercial appeal. So it'll be me talking Grizzlies Warriors game two, the hits, the misses, the pros, the cons, everything hopefully positive. And I'm sure there will be some growth points as well heading out to Los Angeles. That'll be the focus of our Thursday edition of Locked On Grizzlies. To Michael, uh, since this will be your last episode for a day, uh, anything that you want to leave us with heading into game two? Uh, I'll add to your Luke Kennard point that that's something I want to see too because I think I mentioned it on here already, but he said something very interesting after game one where he basically said Taylor Jenkins drew up a lot of plays for him. He just wasn't physical enough. Uh, the mm. Lakers were very physical with him, as we saw. Dennis Schroeder, all those guys, very physical. Luke Kennard says he has to match their physicality. Let's see how he does that, because if he does that and he knocks down those three-pointers, then we got a series. We got a series. A split isn't what Memphis wanted, but they'll take it. It means there would be a Game 5 back home in Memphis, Tennessee. That would be the goal, and then you go out west and try to get one yourself to get that home court advantage back. Thank you so much to everybody who makes Locked On Grizzlies part of their NBA and Grizzlies experience each and every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out on YouTube. Like, comment, rate, review, subscribe, all those fun things. DeMichael and I are very appreciative of all of the feedback, all of the work that you guys put in to make us part of your day. It means more than we could ever say. So continue to do so as the NBA playoffs grind forth. For DeMichael Cole, I am Joe Molinax. Until next time, stay locked in, Grizzlies fans. This is Locked on Grizzlies.